Thank you, Amanda, for that very nice introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation here. It's my mini Florida vacation. After a, a winter that was lingering way too long in New Jersey. Um, I was really impressed with the uh, Movement Disorders Center at the university that you all can take advantage of. I mean, I've seen a lot of these types of places around the country, and this is really, I mean, I can't think of one that's uh, more impressive than just, just dedicated to movement disorders, especially with the routine way they gather data for research. And I want to second Amanda's uh, congratulations and thanks to you all for participating in that. Uh, my talk today, as Amanda said, is about the uh, atypical Parkinsonisms. Uh, now, what we mean by that um, is something that looks like Parkinson's disease but isn't. So we really shouldn't call it atypical because why should regular Parkinson's disease be called typical and some other disease is atypical? They're just different. And as for them being, sometimes they're called the Parkinson plus disorders as if they're Parkinson's disease plus other things. Well, actually, they're not that either. They're just a different set of areas of the brain that are affected. And what they all have in common with Parkinson's is that they cause slowness and stiffness and some poor balance. Uh, and that's about all they have in common, because they affect that one little part of the brain that makes dopamine, the substantia nigra. And other than that, they're, they can be really quite different from Parkinson's disease. So it's also a misnomer to call them the Parkinson plus disorders. And, and all these points will become clear as the slides progress. Uh, first of all, my obligatory listing of uh, places that provide places that provide money for my work to whom I am most grateful. You all remember Dudley Moore, star of the Arthur movies and Ten. He's probably the most famous person who's ever had progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, which is one of the more famous of these disorders that I'll be talking about today. Here's another one who had one of these disorders, John Cash. He had multiple system atrophy. So here's a listing of the most important of these atypical Parkinsonisms along with Parkinson's disease for the sake of comparison. You can see, do I have a pointer? All right, you can see these six disorders. Uh, this slide shows the, uh, the clinical features of them. In other words, the outward signs and symptoms. Levodopa, and with that, it's brainstem problems. And by brainstem, 
I mean, things that directly affect the little muscles of the face, the head, the throat. They come directly out of the brain stem. So the eye movements, speech, swallowing. Those are the main things affected in GSP, in addition to the, um, to the trouble with slowing and uh, stiffness and poor balance, uh, which they all have in common. CBD, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration, or cortical basal degeneration. Uh, again, it's motor, but that one is distinguished by asymmetry. One side of the body is always much, much worse than the other side, and remains worse through the whole course of the disease. Apraxia is, a, is a, the other main feature of CBD. It's where the person loses an ability to do practiced movements. Apraxia, for example, if you tell the person, uh, show me how to salute like a soldier, <coughs> instead of just doing this, they will kind of that. Or show me how to hitchhike. Instead of doing that, they will that. That's apraxia. It's as if you're trying to teach a two-year-old how to do these things for the first time. And as I said, it's very asymmetric. So that's the marquee feature of cortical basal. Now both PSP and cortical basal are much rarer than, PS than Parkinson's. PSP is only about 4% as common as Parkinson's, and cortical basal is maybe 1%, if that, as common as Parkinson's. Multiple system atrophy is a little more rare than PSP. It's more common than CBD. This is, uh, it's called multiple system atrophy, meaning systems in the brain, not, not the respiratory digestive, that's not what that refers to. Multiple systems in the brain but these others are multiple system disorders as well. They affect multiple areas of the brain, just like MSA does. So really, this is not a good name. Uh, but in addition to the Parkinsonian, the uh, muscle stiffness and slowness, in MSA it features autonomic problems and some other things that I'll talk about in a minute. Now these other things, dementia with Lewy bodies and frontotemporal dementia, as you would guess, these feature dementia as their main problems. In the case of DLB, there's a lot of hallucinations that are not a side effect of cinnamon like they are in Parkinson's disease sometimes. Rather, they occur on their own without any medication to cause them as a side effect. And sometimes they can be even the first symptom of the disease. And in frontotemporal dementia, the main feature is disinhibition, where the person just kind of loses their normal social constraints on how they behave. So it may start with things like uh, going up to a person of the opposite sex in the street and propositioning them. You know, somebody who's a complete stranger. Or, uh, or just uh, taking off clothes in public, that kind of thing. Um, that's, that is um, the initial feature of FTD. Okay, but all these things can have, as I say, the basic Parkinsonism. <laughs> slowness and stiffness because they affect that dopamine-based nucleus. Now, now we get down into the real science here. If you don't already know, let me tell you that in the past, oh, 10, 15 years, it's become apparent to scientists that all of the neurodegenerative disorders all of these disorders, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and Lou Gehrig's disease, they all are based on some kind of protein in the brain that is abnormally aggregated. It's clumping up in an abnormal way. Now, this is a protein that is normally present in, the, in each case, each disease. It's a, pre it's a protein that's normally present in the brain. It does something that we need it to do, but, in, and now it's folding in an abnormal way, and when it misfolds, it tends to clump up. And when it starts to clump up, it can cause toxicity in the brain cells. And each of these diseases has its own protein that's doing this. And in many cases, it's the same protein for more than one disease. And uh, there are some diseases that have more than one protein clumping up. 
uh, sometimes in the same patient, and in some cases in different patients. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, one of the proteins that clumps up is this one, tau protein, and the other one is a completely different protein called beta amyloid. That's Alzheimer's. Now, in Parkinson's disease, it's, it's alpha synuclein, and in multiple system atrophy, it's alpha synuclein and dementia with Lewy bodies. And this tau protein is in PSP, CDD, and FTD. Uh, the, the alpha synuclein uh, was first discovered by my group back in the 1990s when we, we encountered this big family, huge family with many different branches, uh, lived in many countries. I traveled all over and I found 61 people in the family with Parkinson's disease. And we were able to get their blood samples and isolate the gene. And it turned out that it was the gene for alpha synuclein, which is a protein that was already known, but nobody thought it had anything to do with Parkinson's. The normal, uh, until then, the normal role of alpha synuclein has something to do with organizing the chemicals inside the brain cells so they can be, they can be excreted and put out as neurotransmitters. Normal function of tau protein is to help maintain the internal skeleton of the brain cells. Okay, so here's Parkinson's disease, and these pretty pink spheres are the, the way the alpha synuclein clumps up. These are called Lewy bodies, named after Dr. Lewy, who discovered them back about 100 years ago. And um, actually in the 1920s sometime. Uh, now this brown stuff, which looks nasty, is actually normal. That's normal pigment in, in brain cells. It, it only occurs in some types of brain cells. And the process of Parkinson's has a predilection for brain cells that have this pigment. It's called melanin. It's very similar to the melanin that's in our hair and our skin. It's not exactly the same, but very similar. It has the same name. So it's called neuromelanin. And there's something else that the brain cells that are susceptible to this alpha synuclein have in common. And that is that they tend to use dopamine as their neurotransmitter chemical. The chemical that they use to communicate with other brain cells. You know, you realize that's how brain cells communicate. It's not a, a direct electrical connection like in, like in your radio. It's where the brain cells, there's a little gap between brain cells called the synapse, and the cells send a little burst of droplets of chemical across that gap in a coded message to communicate with neighboring brain cells. So the brain cells that use dopamine for that purpose tend to be more susceptible to this process in Parkinson's. Now the area of the brain that's involved in Parkinson's and in the other disorders that I'm talking about, this is it, the substantia nigra, the dark substance, these little kind of comma-shaped things there. It's in the brain stem, which is the part of the brain that attaches to the spinal cord down here. These other parts of the brain are the other parts of the basal ganglia. They are not directly affected by Parkinson's, but they certainly are indirectly affected. And when we do the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, that you've all heard of, we put the stimulator into a part of the basal ganglia that's not directly affected, but that's indirectly affected. Okay, now, another important concept that has emerged just in the past few years about how these diseases occur, including Parkinson's, including PSP, MSA, all of them, is that they spread through the brain. They start in one place and they spread out from there. In the case of Parkinson's, it probably starts down here in the brain stem. Actually, it may actually start in the colon, in the large intestine. Because the first aggregation of alpha synuclein seems to be down in the intestine. And the problem probably spreads up through the nerve that connects the intestine to the brain. Didn't think your intestine was connected to your brain. Well, it is. 
And the place in the brain where the intestine is connected is down here at the very lower end of the brain stem. It's the vagus nerve that comes up there. And this spot is where Parkinson's seems to start. And it spreads upward from there. And it doesn't reach the substantia nigra. This is that dopaminergic part that is responsible for the slowness and the stiffness and the symptoms that you're all familiar with. It doesn't reach that point until about halfway through the whole process. And then it spreads upward from there. In the case of the other disorders, other than Parkinson's disease, PSP, etc., it seems not to start down here. It starts in a different spot. Now, let's talk about multiple system atrophy. Um, this condition, as I said, affects multiple systems, but then so do all of those disorders. At one time, we didn't know that this was all the same disease. Up until 1989, we thought they were separate diseases, and they were called striatonigral degeneration if the main symptom was slowness and stiffness, Parkinsonism. We called it shy drager syndrome if the main problem was autonomic, in other words, low blood pressure, constipation, bladder problems. And we called it sporadic olivopontocerebellar ataxia, which, <laughs> thankfully, that term is now gone. It affected mainly the cerebellar system, which means looking like you're drunk, you know, kind of wavering like that. That's a cerebellar problem. And this disease affects these three, these three areas of the brain, but not in the same proportion in different patients. So, for example, one person may be at this point in the triangle with about equal amounts of autonomic and Parkinsonian and almost no cerebellar. Another person may be at this point in the triangle with about equal amounts of the three. And here is what I mean by the, here's the cerebellum. This is an MRI scan. Here are the eyeballs, the lenses in the eyes. There's the cerebellum back here. It's responsible for balance and coordination. And here is a cerebellum that has shrunken. You can see it's, it's like ribs. It's the folds of the cerebellum that are easier to see now that the cerebellum has shrunken. This fluid-filled space has enlarged as a result. And this, which is part of the brain stem, <coughs> has developed scarring. And the scarring occurs in this cross pattern. And this is called the hot cross bun sign, because this looks like a hot cross bun with these little legs coming out of it. This is, this is the connection between the brain stem and the cerebellum. Hot cross bun sign. This is one of the best diagnostic tests we have for this disease, believe it or not. Multiple system atrophy, the hot cross bun sign on the MRI. Now, when you look at the brain of somebody with MSA, here are those alpha-synuclein aggregates that I was talking about. And they are in a set of cells called the oligodendrocytes. These are thought to be the uh, cells that make the insulation of the, in the brain. And it was these, these clumps of alpha-synuclein that were discovered in 1989 to be present in those three subtypes of MSA. And that's how scientists figured out the three subtypes were really the same disease. They all had these little clumps. Of course, we, we didn't know at the time that they were alpha synuclein. That took another 10 years. OK, that we can skip. There actually is another protein that aggregates in MSA, much less uh, well studied. Now here, for the sake of comparison, is Alzheimer's disease. This is a normal brain sliced this way. And here's a shrunken brain from somebody with Alzheimer's. And this shows those two proteins. Remember I said in Alzheimer's there are two proteins that clump up. This is the tau here that forms these things. They're called neurofibrillary tangles. And, and the beta amyloid forms these things called amyloid plaques. Uh, just to give you a little perspective on how the Parkinsonian disorders fit into the general 
spectrum of the neurodegenerative disorders. Bless now, this uh, slide, which is a little too complicated to really show, uh, especially with a room this large, the purpose of this slide, I'll just give you an overall kind of uh, con conceptual description of this. This shows the varying overlaps between the appearance of the brain through a microscope and the appearance of the person outwardly. These pink rectangles are the clinical pictures, the various clinical appearances of people that take the form of various diseases. So for example, um, here's PSP, there's one form of PSP, another form of PSP, here's corticobasal, here's frontotemporal dementia, uh, and the, the green and purple are the appearance through the microscope. And you see there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence at all. It's like, it's like two different universes here almost. So my point is that somebody who looks outwardly like they have PSP might actually have one of the other disorders in some cases. This is still a very active area of research, figuring out the correspondence of the clinical features and the microscopical features. Uh, this I think we can skip, especially given the uh, <coughs> small type. Okay, now, cortical basal degeneration. What is cortical basal? We've talked about uh, PSP somewhat, uh, multiple system atrophy somewhat. Cortico basal, this is the rarest one of these. Remember I said it's very asymmetric. It has apraxia, you know, the problem with motor organization. Uh, that's what we call the cortico basal syndrome, CBS. But there can be other, other clinical appearances. It can look frontal behavioral, like FTD. Remember I talked about the patients who are inappropriate in public? CBD can do that sometimes. A uh, type of aphasia, where you can't think of words, or the language, that can happen with CBD. And sometimes it can look just like PSP. Now conversely, if you take a collection of brain samples that have the, um, no, this was a collection of brain samples that have CBD, and this is what the patients can look like. This is a collection of patients, living patients, who have the cortical basal outwardly, and this is the collection of possible microscopic appearances that they can have. A lot of variation. There's only about a 50% of people who have the outward classic appearance of cortical basal who have the microscopic appearance of cortical basal. The other 50% will have one of these other things. And this is what cortical basal looks like on the MRI scan. This uh, is sliced like that. And this would be the patient's left, and this is the patient's right. And here's the brain stem. And as you can see, one side is shrunken much more than the other. You don't have to be a radiologist to see that. This is classic cortical basal. And this is what the brain looks like. It's ballooning up of cortical basal, the brain cells. All right, now let's talk a little more about PSP. These, this shows those clumps of tau protein called neurofibrillary tangles. This is, this is one form they take, that's another form they can take. And uh, so the patients with PSP, they, as I said, they have mainly brain stem problems, they have trouble moving their eyes, they have trouble speaking, trouble swallowing, but they start out with walking and balance problems, uh, it can get very disabling, and it does not respond much to medication. So we're looking for a genetic cause of this. Now, PSP is not a hereditary disease. 
You could talk to 100 people with PSD, and you ask them, does anyone else in your family have PSD? And they'll all say no. Uh, nevertheless, there is a minor genetic component. And there is this, uh, there is this variation in the tau gene. It's called the H1 haplotype, which is present 94% of the time in people with PSP, and about the same in CBD in controls, which means people who don't have these diseases. It's still present in the majority, but not nearly as much as PSP and CBD. Skip that. So the conclusions are that this H1, that to have both of your chromosome 17s, you know, we each have two copies of each chromosome, one from our mother, one from our father. So you have two chances to have this variation. People who have the, uh, and that's what that was on that slide I, I skipped, one, the people who have both of their gene, both of their chromosomes with the H1 is nearly necessary, but far from sufficient for PSP to develop. So we can say it's statistically associated. And if you have one of your chromosome 17s with the opposite haplotype, that reduces your risk of PSP. So what else conditions the genetic effect besides this haplotype? Well, in order to uh, answer that question, we, we, if you were a scientist and you had to figure out the cause of these disorders, you would say to yourself, okay, each of these disorders has been discovered to have some protein that's building up. So let's figure out how the brain cells normally get rid of that protein. Maybe it's a defect in that disposal, that turnover disposal system in the, in the brain cells. And here is the cell's uh, garbage disposal. Kind of looks like a garbage disposal. It's a cylindrical thing where proteins go in the top and they get chewed up and they come out the bottom. And if you look down the bore of this, uh, this is what you would see. These are each of these colored things is a different protein. It's a very complicated structure. It's called the proteasome. And why would the proteasome get overloaded? The proteasome itself seems to be working fine, except it's overloaded. It's as, it's as if you try to put too much in your garbage disposal at once. It'll just clog up and, and nothing's going to happen. So uh, here's what may be happening. Um, this shows a protein called the prion protein that can misfold in the brain. And, it, and this is a representation of how it misfolds. And when it misfolds, this protein causes other prion proteins that start out normal, causes them to misfold. And each of them causes other prion proteins to misfold until it's a chain reaction and you get lots and lots of prion proteins clogging up the brain. And this is what happens in mad cow disease. You've heard of mad cow disease? You've heard of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease? Uh, heard of uh, Kuru? That's a disease that the uh, cannibals of New Guinea got because they ate brains of their, of their deceased relatives as a sign of respect. Uh, and, and that's how this got passed down from one person to another. The, this this uh, prions uh, were able to be um, transmitted by uh, direct inoculation or eating of brain tissue. So, a disease like Creutzfeldt-Jakob, which is present in, in Western societies, very rare, but it's a neurodegenerative disease, it can be transmitted by um, uh, unclean surgical instruments, for example, or um, it's been transmitted by a hormone injection, so growth hormone that's been obtained from people who have the disease. That doesn't happen anymore. We now have procedures to prevent that. But back before this was understood, there were a few cases that got the disease that way. Now, I'm not saying that Parkinson's does that. It does not. And these other things, PSP, MSA, they don't behave that way either. 
Nevertheless, there may be a milder version of the same prion process that's happening in all of these disorders. And this may be how the abnormally folded protein is spread through the brain by this chain reaction. This is now a very popular theory among scientists. Except instead of it being the prion protein, in the case of Parkinson's, it's alpha-synuclein. And in the case of TSP, it's tau protein. All right, what else might be causing these Parkinsonian disorders? Uh, you'll have a lecture on Parkinson's disease in a little while, so I won't talk about that. But the cause of PSP, uh, there's very little known about environmental con contributions to that slight genetic influence. We know there's a little bit of a genetic influence. It's not enough to account for the disease. There must be something else. So let's look at environmental exposures. Uh, lesser education, I discovered this in a survey I did a long time ago, it was then confirmed. People who have PSP, when you, when you ask, did you graduate from high school, they're less likely to say yes than a group of people without PSP from the same community, same age. So in other words, demographically otherwise similar people. There seems to be something about education that protects a little bit against PSP. The same finding has occurred in Alzheimer's disease. It may be that education just allows you, your brain to build up a little more circuitry so that many decades later, after you graduate from school and some disease comes along, you have more to work with, you have more to compensate with, more of a reserve than if you had not had as much education. Uh, Another possibility to explain this education effect is that maybe there's some toxin that is the factor, some chemical in the environment, and people who don't graduate from high school tend to work in jobs that expose them to more toxins. They tend to work in factories. They tend to, rather than in offices, uh, factories or farms, uh, they tend to um, maybe live in a part of town, the lower rent part of town, where there tends to be more toxins because of industrial uh, installations there. Uh, it may be a dietary problem. People who don't have much education tend to be poorer, poorer people have a different diet than richer people. Okay, so that's a very interesting thing that requires more study. Now, could it be diet causing PSP? Well, there's a, a, a good clue about this from the island of Guadalupe, where there are some people that, um, that there seems to be a lot of PSP and this atypical Parkinsonism there in Guadalupe, and maybe some nearby islands. And it turns out that the people there eat a lot of these fruits called sweet sop and sour sop. And those fruits have been found to harbor a toxin, which when you extract the toxin from the fruit, and according to one research group, they injected it into rats, and the rats came down with what looked like PSP in their brains. Now there's another Island, uh, Guam in the Pacific. Guadalupe is in the Caribbean, of course. Guam is in the Pacific. <coughs> we don't know what causes the disease that's on Guam. Uh, various theories have been discounted, and uh, now there's a lot more research going on uh, on this island. There's not much research going on with the Guadalupe issue, unfortunately. So here's Guadalupe in the Caribbean, beautiful place. And here are those two fruits. They extract a, a soft drink, and you can even buy it at your local store. Go to a Caribbean grocery. There it is. Sour sop and sweet sop. I advise you avoid it. <laughs> now, consumption, uh, this, this shows the statistics of the association on uh, Guadalupe 
of people who had the atypical Parkinsonism and consumed the uh, sweet sop or sour sop. All right, so kind of to pull this all together, how would this kind of thing, all these concepts I've been talking about, how would they result in these neurodegenerative disorders? Well, the dietary thing, yeah, it, it may be a little bit of a fact that we may find something in our diet here, in a, a Western diet, that increases your risk of getting Parkinson's or PSP or MSA. There's a little bit of a genetic effect. Uh, maybe education has a little bit of an effect, at least in PSP. Those things each seem like pretty small influences we still don't have the majority of the answer. And there are some scientists, myself included, who think that there's a big element of chance going on. And that chance is called stochastic effects. Here's a hypothetical. This is just hypothetical, I must emphasize. It's just a theory. In the case of PSP and FTD, tau aggregation is on the vertical axis in time. We're talking about a person's lifetime here, decades. And here's their tau protein, and it's aggregating a little bit, and it gets de-aggregated, gets disposed of. The aggregated tau gets disposed of by that proteasome that I showed you, that garbage disposal. And it's just kind of a random thing, a little bit, maybe a, you're exposed to a little bit of a toxin here and there, and that causes your tau to aggregate a little bit. But then it gets disposed of, and you're chugging along fine, randomly, with your level of tau aggregation kind of going up and down. And as you age, your garbage disposal mechanism is aging, and it doesn't work so well. And uh, you get to be a certain age, and one of these random blips reaches a certain threshold, a certain level. And at that point, the garbage disposal stops. Just like your kitchen garbage disposal, it can take care of lots of stuff that you throw at it, but when you put that steak bone in together with the artichoke leaves, that's when the thing stops. And that may be what happens here. It's not that it stops, it's just that the aggregation, that prion-like aggregation, that chain reaction I showed you, where the abnormally folded protein causes its normal brethren to abnormally fold, and that that influences others, that process at that point starts to take off. It reached a certain critical level, starts to take off, and that's when you start to get so much misfolded protein that they start damaging the brain cells. That's the theory. All right, uh, how much time do we have left? What are you filming? About five minutes. Okay, good. Um, I just want to go through some, uh, some information about treatment of the atypical Parkinsonian disorders. Um, in PSP, it responds, uh, a minority of the patients respond to levodopa, and they only do so for a year or two, and a lot of these brain stem problems do not respond, as you would expect. They don't use dopamine down there. It's only the stiffness and the walking problem, the slowness, they may respond to levodopa. This shows that data in more detail. Amantadine is something else that can help PSP. This is an old-time Parkinson drug, but even when other Parkinson drugs don't work in PSP, amantadine can sometimes help. A lot of doctors don't know this. Amitriptyline, uh, there's been one small trial in four patients that showed some benefit. Uh, I've stopped using it because it just seemed to cause more side effects than anything else. But some doctors still use it for PSP. In Europe, they seem to use it a lot. That shows the data from my patients on that. Antidepressants can help the depression of PSP and, and the depression of CBD. They can also help the depression of multiple system atrophy. Depression is a very common symptom in all these. But there's been no controlled trials. 
there's not a lot of data of any sort. Sometimes the antidepressants can help the pseudo-vulgar affect. That's uninhibited laughing or crying that sometimes happens in these disorders. And the cholinesterase inhibitors, which are these memory drugs that are advertised for people with Alzheimer's disease, that's what they're officially approved for, uh, like uh, Aricet, etc., Exelon, they, um, they can help a little bit in some people with PSP. There, was, uh, there were two trials of, of Aricet showing no benefit in PSP. Exelon, I usually will give it a shot just to see if it works. If it doesn't work after a month or two, I'll give up on it. This one, uh, Manantine, uh, that is often used for Alzheimer's, that has not helped any of the Parkinsonian disorders. Experimental treatments. Uh, these various <coughs> drugs have different kinds of mechanisms of action. And uh, it was really a disappointment for these first two. We had high hopes, especially for this one. Uh, this, this, the trial this, uh, was proven negative just a couple of months ago. Um, coenzyme Q10 has been shown not to help Parkinson's disease, but it may help PSP. There's been one trial that shows that it does modestly. There's another trial in progress. Uh, this shows the details of the benefit for the coenzyme Q10. It's only 4% of the baseline on the PSP rating scale, but still, that's a, a useful degree of, uh, of improvement. And if you don't have side effects and if the drug doesn't cost too much, I would say this is worth using. This needs to be confirmed. This shows that the coenzyme Q10 actually helps the um, uh, production of energy in the brain using a, a measurement of energy on MRI. So in coenzyme Q10 in PSP, there's been one small double blind trial over six weeks. We don't know if the level of improvement would have been maintained. We don't know if the level of improvement would continue, would increase with continued treatment. There's another double blind trial going on that will end this year. It did not work in Parkinson's, but it seems to be well tolerated. And the price has come down. It used to be $200 a month, now it's only $50 a month. In the atypical Parkinsonisms, deep brain stimulation is not useful, unfortunately, except there are some experiments now with, with uh, this nucleus, the pedunculopontine nucleus, DBS. It's not looking that good, but still the experiments are not yet reported, so we have high hopes. This shows the pedunculopontine nucleus, it's in the brain stem, that area that's heavily involved in PSP. And finally, uh, potential uh, experimental drug targets that are suggested by that prion model. Can we inject antibodies that interrupt one step of that process, like a vaccine? Maybe some drugs will inhibit one step of that process by inhibiting that abnormal folding. And finally, the brave new world of genome sequencing. You all remember the Human Genome Project from 20 years ago, well, which sequenced one person and took billions of dollars and several years. Well, we can now do it in uh, a couple of weeks for a uh, couple of thousand dollars. And it's not, it's not uh, applicable for normal medical care yet, but um, it may be soon. And so that may reveal other genetic influences that we don't know about yet. So maybe the genetic things will eventually add up. And once we have a genetic influence, we may be able to modify the function of some pathway that's identified by those genes may point to a specific drug target and a specific protein that we don't know about yet. We may be able to do gene therapy, put a normal version of the mutated gene in the patient's cells, 
We may be able to implant cells that are engineered to perform the defective function. That's what stem cells might do. Stem cells might do this as well. Everything I'm saying here applies to the atypical Parkinsonisms as well as to Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. There are problems with this. Delivering drugs into the brain is difficult. Uh, it's invasive, it can have side effects. It's hard to know which genes are the culprit in a given person. Hopefully there will be diagnostic tests available in the next few years to tell that. And there are non-genetic components to the causes of all these. And for more information, you should all know about these organizations devoted to PSP and the other, the same organizations are devoted to the other atypical Parkinsonian disorders. Thank you.